I, I, I tell my students sometimes that China is really a, a demographer's paradise because so much is happening there and you have to keep up because it's happening so quickly, things could change. Um, I talk about demographic exceptionalism. Exceptionalism was really began in Europe when they, philosophers dealt with the issue of something being, being unique and it had, a, it had a lot of importance in the growth of nationalism in Europe. And American exceptionalism says that the, that the United States is qualitatively different from other, from other countries because of the issues of egalitarianism and so forth. And um, Americans are very, they all believe this. They, are, they, they hold very close to this idea. Um, but China, even more so, going back 4,000 years, they have a real sense of civilization superiority. Um, the Chinese name, a lot of Chinese people here, they know this already, Zhonghua means the central kingdom. And people like me, a foreigner, I'm an outsider, I'm a Weigwaran, I'm a, a barbarian. Um, and the Chinese believe this. Um, I have here that most of us are Weigwaran looking around, that's not true. Uh, there are a lot of Zhongguaran uh, here today. Um, but China, China is superior, the 4,000 years of a, a civilization. Um, but I think if we take into account population policy and we view population policy, this has led to several demographic events of major, major importance that will influence not only China, but some of them will also influence the world. And that's why I'm calling this China's changing demography is changing China and changing the world. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on five key features of Chinese demography, and everything started with the dramatic fertility transition, one of the fastest ever recorded in human history that began in the, in the it really began in the 1960s, when Chinese, just after the Great Leap Forward, about 1961, Chinese women were having seven babies each. And there was a very fast reduction. There were some interruptions with the Cultural Revolution, uh, but it was a very fast reduction in, in 30 years, and it's led to five things. I hope I'm gonna have time to do this today. I have until about 1.45, um, 1.50, okay. The demographic dividend is disappearing. China will no longer be the manufacturer of the world. China is becoming increasingly old, and they don't have the social structure to support old people. China has been having an unbalanced sex ratio at birth. Bi biological average about 105. China has been at 119, 120 and it's produced millions of boys who will not be able to find girls to marry. Internal migration, floating migration from China, as much as 230 to 240 million people are migrating from the rural areas into the cities on the East Coast, and that has tremendous implications. And then China's increasing level of urbanization back in, when Mao Zedong took over the country in 1949, about 10% of the country was urban. Now it's about 50% and it'll probably be 70% uh, by the year 2050. When there will be 1 billion, there should probably be 1 billion urban people in China. So that's what I want to focus on. Everything began with the fertility transition. The red line is the birth rates. You can see as high in 1961 as seven babies per woman, and then it dropped dramatically with different policies. There was a policy, a short-range policy in the mid-1960s, which was interrupted by the Cultural Revolution, and, but that was responsible to get the fertility rate to begin to drop in 1971. The Wanxi Xiao policy was initiated the one child policy began in 1979. And look at the chart. Now, right now, China's fertility rate is about 1.5. And many demographers in China believe it's even lower, maybe 
So this is, this is one of the fastest fertility reductions in recorded human history. Now, this little chart shows a little bit of the, of the policies since 1971 with the, with the, the, uh, the policy from 71 to 79, Wan Shi Shao, later, later age at first marriage, longer birth intervals between children and fewer children. Wan Shi Shao, that was the first nationwide policy, 1971. And then in 1979, the one child policy took over. And most people think that it has been the one child policy ever since, but that's not true. About the mid 1980s, rural families, if they had the first baby was a, a daughter, could have a second child in most of the, of the provinces. So that led to what we demographers call the one and a half child policy. And up until about 2013, when the government allowed any couple with, with an only one, with a, a, a parent being an only child, they were then allowed to have two. So that sort of brought it up to maybe a 1.75 policy. And then uh, just last October, you probably all remember that the government did away with the policy. And now it's a two, but it's even more than a two. And by the way, demographers had a big impact on the government making that change. That's another story. But when you think about what we academicians do, does anybody care what we do? Uh, in this case here, the, we, had a, we had a big impact uh, in the country changing the policy. This just shows here the, 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 the blue is South Korea. South Korea, uh, compared to the gold, China, South Korea also experienced a very fast policy, a very fast fertility transition. And theirs was more driven by socioeconomic changes. So that drives home this very important fact that the population policy did not bring the fertility rate down in China. South Korea didn't have a policy. And they've, with increasing emancipation of women, labor force participation, education, much the same thing that happened in China. And that was our, our new doctor, uh, paper number two, uh, that was her. So if anybody wants a, a lot of information, uh, again, you should get an applause for a very good defense today. Very good. Um, but uh, she, the, the second paper in her dissertation shows the importance of socioeconomic development. And that's why, for instance, the Chinese people, some of the old men who run the government, said, well, if we take the policy away, there's going to be a baby boom. It's not going to be a baby boom because it's been driven socioeconomically. Let me show you a contrast here. This is my country. We also went through a fertility transition from seven babies per woman. Uh, but it, we had 150 years to do it. So in the process of the United States becoming a rural to an urban country and moving from seven babies per woman down now to a little bit under two babies per woman, there are plenty of time to change the norms and, the, and the, the behaviors within a society from seven babies per woman down to two. China has done this in 30 years. They haven't had time to change uh, the norms uh, that, are, that are so important because fertility is a social process. Women and men decide to have babies based on, 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 the, social, on the social structure. Here's, here are the fertility rates today. I should have put in, I should have put in uh, the United Kingdom uh, um, right a little bit. Well, I did put in 140. It is there. Sorry, 140. A little bit higher than the United States. Um, but South Korea, 1.3. Taiwan, 1.1. China is probably 1.4. The government says 1.6. And then the lowest, Singapore, 0.8. Just to give an idea of, of where... China fits in with other countries that we know about. Okay, so here's number one. When China got started, the People's Republic of China got started in the 19, 1950, this is what the country looked like. Demographers call this a population pyramid. And the gold, the gold are the producers. These are people 15 to 64 years of age. And they're the people who do all the work. And the, the top piece, the gray are the old people, and the green are the young people. So this is what demographers refer to as a dependency, age dependency. The people on top are dependent on the ones in the middle, and the people at the bottom are dependent on the ones in the middle. So in 1950, about under 50% of the country was in the working age uh, uh, population. 
So this working age group had to provide for children and not too many old people, about 52% of the population. Now, Mao Zedong died in 1976. And this guy, Deng Xiaoping, he never was the, officially the leader of China, but he set the policies. He called socialism with Chinese characteristics. He opened up China to the West. He opened up China to the West at a time when the fertility reduction was underway. So a combination of the fertility reduction and Deng Xiaoping allowing foreign investment to come into the country. And let me mention another thing about Deng Xiaoping. He came to Texas in 1979 and he said, they said to him, where do you want to go? And he said, I want to go to a provincial event. So they took him to a rodeo and they gave him a hat. And he was only about four feet high, small, a small man. Here is what China looks like for the past 10 or 15 years. This is what is called the demographic dividend. And if it hadn't been, and you can see you have, you have many fewer people at the bottom because of a very low fertility rate. You still don't have many people up at the top because you had so few people moving up to become elders. So most, most countries go through this stage as they drop their birth rates from high to low. But in China, it was particularly of interest because it happened at the same time Deng Xiaoping opened up the country to foreign investment. So here we have now 60% of the country are the producers. This is why China today is the world's manufacturer because of the demographic dividend. Lots of workers, not as many young people because the birth rate is so low, and still not many old people to have gotten, to have become dependent. Now, as those producers get older, they're gonna get moving up the pyramid, right? And eventually they're gonna be up at the top of the pyramid. But there's not a lot of new people coming in at the bottom to then become the producers because the fertility rate is so low. So here's what's gonna happen in 2030. The blue is the pyramid for China in 2030. They don't any longer have the labor force to do all the work. And they have no young people there to take over because the birth rate has been so low. So this is why by 2030, China will no longer be the, manuf the world's manufacturer. I tell my undergraduate students, take a look at your shirts, the back of your shirts, and they, many of them will say made in China. Although little by little, now we're seeing made in Bangladesh and made in, just China is beginning to process a lot of their manufacturing out, but it'll be worse in another 15 or 20, or 20 years. I have, a, I have a slide I'm not gonna show, which shows year by year by year how the, how the population became uh, became older. So China, in the process of getting to 2050, China has had a tremendously large demographic dividend, but that dividend has been declining. And by 2030, it will no longer be there. So that's why in the coming years, China will no longer be the world's manufacturer. It happened for two things. Deng Xiaoping opened the country and you had a very low birth rate. So those things together provided this big, China's become so rich, their economy grows at nine and 10% per year. But now that's beginning, even now these days, that's beginning to slow down to 7% because they can't continue the heavy job in manufacturing. So that's number one. The age structure, China was very young, it's getting old and it'll get even older. Now this is a change, whereas the Changing demographic dividend is going to affect the world, has a big effect on the United States in terms of, of manufacturing, uh, exporting, importing. This particular one, number two, is mainly going to affect China. So again, age distribution. Look back in, 19, in 1950, very, very few old people, very, very few old people. A lot, of, a lot of young people, and 
about the same number of people in the middle. This is the same as the pyramid I showed earlier, but you have everybody together. Men and women here are together, and it's, it's tilted the other direction. And then you can see the, uh, the demographic dividend getting bigger. That's the group there in the middle. But then look at by 2050. Look at how many people at the top you have. How much older China will be in 2050, older in terms of the percentage of the population that is old. By 2050, China's elderly population will be 31% of the whole population. Now, now in China, it's 15%. So just in another 35 years, it'll double from 15% to 30%. And all this has happened so fast that China has not been able to develop adequate elderly support programs. The economy doesn't have enough wealth to handle such a large senior population. And then you have the lack of working laborers because that demographic dividend is getting older and you're not having people replaced. So this follows from number one, the fact that the labor force is getting smaller in size. And, but what's happening now is people, the people are getting, are getting older. Here's another way, another way of looking at it. You can see the, the, yellow, the yellow would be the aged people and the, and, the, uh, uh, and the purple would be the, uh, uh, the young people. What's going to happen? Demographers have what's called an age dependency ratio. The number of old people, 65 and over, divided by the people, 15 to 64. So back in 1953, you had about, about maybe five or six old people for every 100 Producers, right? The 100 producers are the people 15 to 64. So then you can see the line begins to, begins to go up so that by 2015, it's about 15 old people per 100, 100 producers. But by 2040, China is the real light blue. Can you see the real light blue? Yeah, the real light blue. So that by, by 2050, China is at 35 old people per every 100 producers. Whereas look at, look at Shanghai. Shanghai by 2050 will be 50 old people for every 100 producers. So again, you see, a, and again, this is a large consequence of a very, very fast fertility, a very, very fast fertility reduction. China now has been becoming a little bit aware of this. They now have a, well, that's some old people. You don't, there, are, there aren't many old rest homes like there are in the United States. Now in the United States, all the old people go to rest homes. Uh, in China, they, they're taken care of by their, their children. But a new law in 2013, elderly parents in China can now, can now sue their grown children for financial and emotional support. The law requires that adult children regularly visit their parents. We have some of these laws in, in some of the states of the U.S. We don't have any in Texas. What about, what about England? What about Great Britain? Does anybody know? Is there such a law, Sabu, where the, the children? No, they don't? Okay. Sons, the sons typically provide the economic support, and the girls provide the emotional support. So that then moves up to another issue. You have all these old people, and the boys and the girls are supposed to provide for their parents. Yet, number three, there are more and more boys who won't be able to find girls to marry. So before I move on to number three, think about it. The boys are providing the money to take care of the parents and the girls are providing the emotional. I have a 51-year-old daughter and a 49-year-old son. My son gives, well, I don't need money right now, but when I get older, he'll give me the money, but my daughter, she'll take care of me. Daddy, are you okay? And she'll call me on the phone. In China, in the future, there aren't gonna be a lot of girls to take care, to be married to these boys. And let me move here to, let me move here to number three. So the, the next topic is China the unbalanced sex ratio at birth. When I was in college back in the 1960s, there was a movie 
uh, starred a woman named Connie Francis. And the movie was called Where the Boys Are. Where the boys are, that's where I want to be. And it was really, it was really an issue of getting girls in the Midwest to where the boys are. And the boys were in Florida at spring break. So the movie is all about these girls going to Florida and meeting the boys. Um, it's a matter of getting the girls. But the key word in the, is, is, um, is where the boys are, someone waits for me. That's the key word in that song. China will be where the boys are, but there'll be nobody waiting for the boys because there won't be any girls there to wait. So China, there won't be anywhere near equal numbers of girls. There'll be millions of boys waiting for girls, but the numbers will be so out of balance that most of these boys won't be able to find girls. So China will be where the boys are, but China won't be where there are girls waiting for them. This happens in any country where four things occur. One, there's a fast fertility transition. We saw that in China. We saw that in Korea. We saw that in Taiwan. Secondly, and we also, by the way, we also saw that in Thailand, a very fast, and we also saw it in some other countries. But a second issue you need to have is the culture has to have a lot of sun preference. And China, based on a Confucian philosophy, has a tremendous amount of sun preference. Third, you have to have a technology that is available to Take a picture of the woman's abdomen and look inside and see, look in and see whether there's a, a fetus in there and whether there's a, a penis on the fetus. And if there is, that means it's a boy. If there's not, it means it's a girl. And then number four, you have to have cultural and physical support of abortion. In the United States, well, we don't even have much. There, 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 many of the states are moving, taking away abortion opportunities, but there's surely no cultural support for abortion in the United States. But in China, there's cultural support and there's physical availability. So if you have these four things, you're going to have a sex ratio, a sex structure that's out of balance. The red line is China. Back in the 1980s, the sex ratio at birth was about 105, 106. Scientists believe that at conception, the sex ratio is about between 110 and 120. Boys, bo boys conceived per girls. And then that drops down to a sex ratio at birth of 105, 105 at birth, virtually all societies in the world. 105 boys born for every 100 girls. And then by about age 20 or age 25, it's even. And that's when the boys and girls get married. married. So it's likely that this biological universal of a sex ratio at birth of 105 is probably an, adapt it's probably an evolutionary adaptation to the, to the biological superiority of women. At every age, women have a lower death rate than men. And it begins at conception. I tell my undergraduate students, for men, it's all downhill. Once those boys are conceived, it's all down downhill. The women are going to do better through conception and then after, after birth. Well, look what happened in China. China right now is 120 boys are born for every 100 girls. 15 more boys per 100 than are needed. The, the, the blue line is Taiwan. Taiwan also had an unbalanced sex ratio. Again, Taiwan had a fast fertility reduction, Confucianism supporting sun preference, availability of sonar technology to determine the sex of the fetus and cultural and physical access to abortion. Taiwan's, uh, Taiwan's uh, SRB, sex ratio of birth, didn't get as high as China's, 110. Um, South Korea got up to 117. South Korea is back now to normal levels. The Chinese and the Koreans are hopeful that will happen to them. Oh, the Chinese and the Taiwan people, sorry. India, India, Sabu, India is now at about 117. India came into this about 10 years after China did. So India is in the same situation. Now, there's no Confucianism in India, but there's heavy sun preference. 
So a lot of countries are experiencing this. This, this is the sex ratio in the United States. It's 105 at birth, and by about, uh, by about age 30, 35, it's 100, and then it's all downhill, so gosh, I'm 75. Um, there are about 65 men per 100 women at my age, and if I, if I make it to 100, uh, there'll be 20 men per 100 women. So you can see the, the natural superiority of women reflected in this chart. At every age, the there are fewer, fewer boys uh, than girls. I've mentioned this already. At conception, it's about 110. The sex ratio is remarkably stable. The father of demography, you all know father of demography, John Grant in, 19, in, the, 19, <laughs> in the 1660s discovered uh, the sex ratio at birth in London uh, of, of 105. And if the sex ratio at birth is not within this biological range, if it's not between 104 and 107, something's happening. Somebody's, somebody's messing around with the biology, i.e. via, via uh, sex-specific abortion. And also maybe there's a little evidence in China that some of this might be due to the underreporting of female births. But we can correct for that by then looking at the census 10 years later to see how many girls are there that were not there earlier. Sex identification of the fetus in China is illegal, but people pay the extra, and the same thing in Taiwan, Korea. So why so much sun preference in China? Many of these countries have a Confucian patriarchal tradition. Female subordination is a major characteristic of Confucianism. Witness the practice for a thousand years of foot binding where the girl's foot would be about two inches in length. That's been outlawed, no longer exists, but it lasted for a thousand years in China. This book of songs that Confucius may have edited illustrates the importance of sons. When a son is born, let him sleep on the bed, clothe him with fine clothes, give him jade to play with, how, how he sounds so wonderful when he cries. May he grow up to wear crimson. May he be the lord of his tribe. So all these great expectations for the son. When a daughter is born, let her sleep on the ground. Wrap her in common wrappings. Give her broken tiles for playthings. May she have no faults. May she attend to food. And may she bring no discredit on her parents. Confucius said, having girls is like spilling water on the ground. Confucius said, having girls is like weeding another man's field. In traditional China, traditional Korea, traditional Japan, traditional Taiwan, the girl would leave the home at age 14 or 15 and would move in with the parents of, the, of her husband, new husband. And the, parent, the girl's parents would only see her one day a year. So it didn't make any sense to put a lot of investment in children. So this sun preference, although China has modernized now, 50% is urban, they're still characterized by this heavy, this culture, this cultural baggage of sun preference that's still a major part. Now, in the United States, we don't have as much sun preference, but they want to have boys, Americans do. But that fertility rate, we had 150 years from high levels to low levels. China had, Korea, Taiwan had 30 years. So the norms haven't changed yet to, to take away some of this cultural baggage. A preference for sons is a hard, part of their culture. When fertility was high, six or seven babies each, the probability was extremely low that none of those six babies would be a male, 2%. By comparison, when women have two children, the probability that neither will be a son is 25%. And when women have one child, the probability that neither will be a son is over 50%. So you can see how the, it wasn't a problem when they had a lot of kids, because you're going to get a boy or two. But when you're only having one child, you run the risk of not having, of not having a boy. And it's mainly prenatal sex identification via female-specific abortion. That's the major way the sex ratio unbalanced sex ratios occurring. 
less so by the underreporting of female births. But that does play a role. This is like those old portable computers. These are all over China. They're all over Korea. They're all over Taiwan. I'll bet you they're all over India also. Um, you put that little wand on the front of the woman to see what the fetus looks like. And a decision is made it's a boy or a girl, depending upon if that penis is hanging. These are all over the place. So how many boys will there be extra boys? I've done some very simple demographic modeling. I can, we can figure out how many boys and girls are born every year and then just use, use life tables and survive those boys to age 27 and survive the girls to age 25 or survive the boys to 29 and the girls to 27. It doesn't make much difference how far ahead you survive the boys and girls. Right now in China, first age of marriage is about 27 for boys, 25 for girls, although it's getting older. But so few babies die before they're in their 20s, it doesn't make much difference how far ahead you put them. So it's very simple to do demographically. And when you do that, you can see how many boys and girls are born every year, survive all the boys up one year at a time up to age 27, survive all the girls age 25, count the extras, and you're going to end up with 40 million boys already born. 40 million boys. The whole state of Texas is only 25 million. 40 million boys. And they're all boys within about a 20 to 30 year range. And if China doesn't reduce its 2010, I showed you the chart, China had a 2010 SRB of 120. If China doesn't reduce it by the year 2020, there'll be 55 million. 40 million. South Korea was able to reduce their sex ratio at birth to 107. So I'm thinking that even if China's able to do it, and I don't think it is, because right now we're in 2016, and the sex ratio at birth is 119, I doubt whether it's going to drop from 119 down to 107 in four years. But even if it did, it would it'd be 51 million boys. This is a big, big number. There are going to be a lot of bachelors running around China. They're, you're beginning to see them now. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. I was, born, I was born and raised in California. That whole state is 37 million people. My home state now of Texas, I've lived there for 45 years. 25 million people. We could have more than, more than a Texas or more than a California of bachelors in China. In Beijing, there are many parks. This Jade Lake Park is near some of the hotels that I go to, and you'll see boys with their mothers. They have, a, they have a wall, and a boy gets a single piece of paper, I guess it's like a resume. He puts down his age, and he puts down his, uh, how much money he has, and whether he has a car, and a flat, and a job, and he posts it on the wall, like this big wall over here. So, and, and then you go to Jade Lake Park, you see all the girls with their mothers looking, and, and of course they have their cell number on, on there too. And the girls writing things down about, the girls are picking from the boys. These are boys who want to find girls to marry. But because there were so many extra boys, the girls can really be choosy. Look at this guy here. This guy, he probably just put his up there, and he's looking to see how his compares with the other boys that are, that are up there. <laughs> This is Jade Lake Park. Each bachelor prepares a resume. Here's a marriage market park in Shanghai. Now here we have a father. This is probably a father of a girl looking over the, the resumes. This is a big change in terms of, uh, of, of the way marriage uh, uh, is handled. Two generations ago in China, in the 1960s, the three standard gifts, it was called the Holy Trio, were a watch, a bicycle, and a sewing machine. In the 1980s, the, the husband had to provide the wives with a television set, a washing machine, and a refrigerator. Now, when these boys are preparing their resumes in Jade Lake Park in Beijing and Shanghai and all the big cities around the country, a good boy, a boy who girls want, will have a car, a flat, an apartment that he's living not with his parents, but his own flat, and uh, a, a salary. So the girls are able now to choose. 
These are, these are now the three rounds for matrimony. What's China going to do with all these troublesome unmarried males, all these young boys with lots of testosterone and no girls? Well, there's some possibilities. Um, Mail order brides are probably not going to happen in China because a lot of these boys are, are what we say in English, the bottom of the barrel. They're the ones nobody wants. Korea is bringing in girls from other countries. But China, the boys aren't rich enough. Some people, I've read people in writing in China, they say, yeah, China's become a country of gay people. All homosexuals in China. I, I don't, I'm, I'm 75 years old. I just don't think that, oh, there are no girls, I'll just take the boys. I just don't think that's going to happen. Now, what's probably going to happen is, is China will become more open to, to gay people than the, than, the, than the country is now. Increased prostitution, absolutely yes. The sex market used to mainly be directed against tourists. You, People, you non-Chinese who have visited China, remember Sabu, you'd walk into a hotel, there'd always be girls following you to your room and putting little cards, <laughs> putting little cards under the door, right? The card, call this number. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether he, I didn't, uh, I just let them put the card under my door. But nowadays the sex market is being pushed more and more toward the Chinese people themselves. The Chinese men are probably going to move to bachelor ghettos in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Tianjin, the big cities, just like the Chinese did when they moved to the United States. I'm sure it works similarly in England, but when the Chinese moved to the United States to help build the Transcontinental Railway and to work in the gold rush in California in the 1800s, 1850s and 40s, when it was all over, they moved to San Francisco or they moved to New York. And the sex ratios then were over 4,000. There were no girls there. So the, the Chinese men relied, on, relied on, uh, on sex trade. Revolution, you know, you've got this little area outside, Taiwan called, uh, outside China called Taiwan, 21 million people. The Chinese believes Taiwan belongs to them. Is it unrealistic to think that they have all these extra boys? So they, they might lose 2 million people in taking back Taiwan. Perhaps that might happen. An unspreaded, an unprecedented spread of HIV. Joseph Tucker, a medical demographer, and I published a book a couple of years ago on HIV, gender policy and HIV in China. And all we did here, we, we did some simulations about what might happen given this amount of boys, given this amount of sex work, given this amount of, of HIV, HIV spread and different assumptions but sex workers are going to be more likely to spread sexually transmitted infections, obviously, than, uh, than people who are not. Plus, you've got my next issue are the, are the floaters, the, the floating migration. So you've got, you've got the 40 million bachelors and you've got 200 million rural to urban migrants, many of whom don't bring their wives uh, and children with them into the cities. So you've got this big base of young men who are not married, the bachelors and the, and the migrants. Right now, there's not a problem with HIV in China. But the work that Joe Tucker and I have done, only via statistical simulation now, we don't have any numbers that point to this. But we do know today Sub-Saharan Africa has about almost 70% of all the HIV cases. If, we, if the stuff that Tucker and I looked at shows that if certain things happen with unbalanced sex ratios at birth, bachelors, uh, floating migrants, heavily male, uh, sex markets, uh, a big amount of sex workers, and a certain percentage of sexually transmitted infections, and then of those, a certain percentage of them being HIV, it's not at all unrealistic to think that China could have a major HIV epidemic uh, in the next 20 to 30 years that could rival, that could rival sub-Saharan Africa. Huge implication. A woman at Texas A&M, a political science professor, uh, Valerie Hudson, 
Here's, it's an old book. The book's been out for 12 years called Bear, called Bear, Bear Branches. Chinese, Chinese call a male who has no family a bear branch. And Valerie looks into a whole bunch, she's a political scientist, she looks into a whole bunch of security implications for China, for other countries. So this, the, the, the millions of bachelors will have a big impact uh, on global society. Here's the internal migration issue. Douglas Massey, the top, one of the top demographers in the world, noted that China's move towards markets and a rapid economic growth may contain the seeds of an enormous migration. Massey was able to, to see the movement of rural people into the cities, on the, mainly on the East Coast. As most of you know, in China, they have a household registration system called a huko, and you're born, if you're born in a rural area, you've got a rural huko, and you're not allowed officially to move to the cities, and your children don't get access to the schools in the cities unless you change your huko from a rural huko to an urban huko. It's very, very difficult, almost impossible to do that. Yet on the East Coast, where all the big cities are, that's where all the jobs are. And the rural areas, there's declining industrialization, technology, high numbers of people without work, so they move illegally to the cities. They still keep their rural hukos, but now they live in cities. And these are called the floating population. 1.3 billion people, a tidal rave of internal migration. Kenneth Roberts states that this is the largest peacetime mobility in recorded human history. And they come in from, they come in from these, those, yellow, those yellow provinces, mainly over to the pink ones on the east coast. That's really, that's really where they're, where they're mainly, mainly coming from. Number of floaters is 11 million in 82, 140 million in the year 2000, over 240 million. 240 million in the year 2010. These are people who are working in the cities and they're, they're, they are there illegally. And yet the, the cities need these people to do what a lot of poor workers do. The, the jobs that are the three Ds, dirty, dangerous, and demeaning. They do the work that the local people don't want to do and they get paid at lower levels, but they get paid more than they'd be making in the rural areas. The analog here with the floating population in China is similar to the undocumented migration to the United States from Mexico. The only difference being these floaters once a year go back to home to their rural areas for the spring festival, whereas the undocumented Mexican migrants, if they make it across the border, into the United States, they don't then return at Christmas time because, the, because of the difficulty crossing the border. But all the other things, all the other things are the same. Every East Coast city's got up to 35%. Shanghai, 30, a 35% a um, of, the, of, the of the whole city are, are floaters. These are some pictures I've taken over the years uh, in different parts of Guangzhou, Xiamen, where there's building going on. And these are, the, these are our floaters. My students who, who take me around China tell me they can listen to their accent and, can, and, for, and also from the way their clothing is and the, their hair standing straight up. Um, there are ways that pick out who the floaters are compared to the permanent residents of the cities. This big piece of concrete, that's very, very heavy. We typically here and in the United States, you'd rent a, a, one of those uh, um, I can't think what to call them, a, a forklift. But those are expensive. Here you just get four, four men to move that big piece of concrete around. Here's some more in, in the ditches. Now, okay, that's all in China, 230, 240 million. But as the economy slows down, as the demographic dividend moves up the pyramid, and the economic growth moves from 9% to 7%. Ahead, it'll be 6%, 4%, 3%. And then they're going to start laying people off. They no longer need all these buildings. They no longer need all this construction. They're going to start firing people. And the first people to get fired are the floaters. 
And the floaties had been sending money home to their home, to their home villages. In some of these rural villages in China, one half of the, of, the, of the product, of the domestic product, are remittances from the floaters. So the floaters play a very important economic role, providing money for, the, for, uh, for rural, rural growth and building, building in rural areas. The Chinese have this feeling of losing face, embarrassment, if you embarrass your families. And they've been sending money home, and now they've lost their job, and their parents, they've been saying, gee, my son in Beijing, he's sending me all this money. Now he's not sending money, he lost his job. They don't want to lose face, so what are they going to do? They're going to start looking where there are other Chinese. And there's already a smuggling system built into China. 25,000 maybe are smuggled into the United States on an annual basis. This human trafficking makes billions of dollars. The smugglers are Chinese people who live in different parts of the United States or China or Europe. They have power and money and connections and they're known as snakeheads, shetto uh, in Chinese. And right now, Right now, most of the Chinese smuggling is from Fujian province, right down there on the bottom, right there opposite Taiwan. And the city of Fuzhou, and there are a couple of little areas around there, is where most of the undocumented Chinese to the United States are coming from. Many of the ones into Europe are coming from Zhejiang province, right north of Fujian province. So many of the, of the undocumented Chinese in Europe and England are, are, are coming from another area. So certain parts of the country are sending them. Here's Fujian, and then Fuzhou is the big city. And then right near Fuzhou, there's Liangjiang County, Changla County, and then six towns. And in, 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 those, in those six towns, in those two counties, are almost all the undocumented Chinese to the United States are coming from there. And they're mainly old people there. My, my, my student, former student, Gubal Cheng, he has taken me around these areas and some people I've worked with in Fuzhou University. We've talked to China. They're mainly old people there. And they, if they don't go abroad and with their countrymen to New York, to Washington, to Los Angeles, to Houston, they, they, they lose face. And so there's, there's this operation already in process which will get bigger if the floaters begin to lose, to lose jobs. So they're smuggled by land and air. Here's how it works. Hong Kong to the US, Hong Kong to La Paz. Some of them come in to Central America and then cross over the border with Mexicans, the Chinese. Air transit is much more popular these days. The costs used to be 18,000. Now it's up to $60,000 per person. A snakehead can make $9 million a day. By comparison, Mexicans are brought across the border by, they call them coyotes, and they charge about $5,000 to bring a Mexican across the border into Houston or Los Angeles or up into New York. A snakehead charges up to $60,000. Now, they've got to go a longer way. They've got to put them on a plane, and the plane, they have stolen passport, fake visa, processed in at JFK or Houston International or LAX and then the snakehead picks them up and takes them to a restaurant where they work in the back rooms and then they eventually pay all their money back. So this smuggling network is already in place. I've been told by subjects I've spoken to in Fujo that it's easier for immigrants to borrow money to pay the smugglers than it is for people in Fujo to borrow money to start businesses in Fujo. The loaners say they're much more certain they're going to be paid back the money if they loan the money who are people who are going to be immigrating illegally to the United States than if they were loaning money to people to start businesses. I spent several days in Fujo and, and I never heard of anybody ever told me of a failure of an undocumented Chinese to pay back the money. But they did tell me about failures of local people who didn't pay back the money. So all of this is in place, and it's all we need is, is for the unemployment rate to start to get up a little higher and to take jobs away from, all, from many of these floaters and 
the smuggling could be incredibly larger. In the United States right now, Mexi more Mexicans are returning, <clears throat> are returning to Mexico than are coming in. We have this crazy man who's running for president named Donald Trump who wants to build a wall around the country, the southern part of the country, to keep the Mexicans out. He doesn't realize that more Mexicans are going back to, back to Mexico uh, than, are coming into the, than are coming into the country. Look at this figure here. The green is Mexico, the red is China, and the, uh, the blue is China, and the red, red is India. That's the number. So every year, about this, this bottom row here is about, it's about 100,000, 100, and over here it's 400,000. So 400,000 Mexicans coming in the United States every year. That's now, now, right now, there are more people from India and more people from China coming to the United States every year than Mexicans. So the Mexican, Donald Trump doesn't know about this chart. The Mexican, <laughs> the Mexican population is no longer in big numbers coming to the United States. So the huge implications for, Mex for, for the United States with regard to the undocumented, undocumented immigrants. Look at the fertility decline in Mexico. Mexico dropped from seven babies per woman no longer do you have a lot of, a lot of babies in Mexico uh, who need to be supported because the birth rate is so low. This first, I won't have time to talk about this fifth one, but again, here we're talking about 50% of China now lives in cities. It'll be 70%, it'll be 70 by, uh, by, the year, by the year 2030. Look at, look at, here's the Great Wall on a clear day. Here's the Great Wall on a day that I was there when it wasn't very clear. Here is the Central Chinese Television Building, a beautiful building in downtown Beijing in October of 2013. And here it is on January 2013. Just from the basis of, of cars, the nighttime traffic in Beijing. In this last part, I discuss the implications of an enormous urbanization in Beijing, Shanghai, um, with 50 to 60 percent. And the country has not kept up with, with regulations about and then, of course, the whole notion of using concrete and a lot more discussion with regard to this. This is an implication that's going to affect the world. Okay, so my analysis, I'm sorry that I've run a little late here. Uh, my analysis portrays a situation that rings with irony. China solved its burgeoning fertility issue of six or seven babies per woman, dropping it down to two babies per woman with a fertility transition that was initiated by policies, but it was then sustained by social and economic development. And it was one of the fastest transitions experienced in any country in the world. But the success and the speed of the transition have exacerbated the problems that I've focused on. The five, I only talked about four of them, but I have five in my lecture. So will the, Chi will the Chinese people and will the world be ready for a billion urban residents. In my notion of automobiles, China, China's got about 100 million automobiles. They're going to have maybe three to four times that number of automobiles. If you think the smog is bad today in Beijing and Shanghai, what will it be when there's four times as many automobiles? Will the, will the, will the world be ready for millions of Chinese elderly? who are mainly being taken care of by their sons because the daughters aren't there. The sons can't have, can a son, can you men take care of your parents emotionally? You can probably give them money, but you need the daughters to take care of the parents emotionally. Will China and the world be ready for China no longer being the world's manufacturer? Will the United States be ready for millions more immigrants from China? So these are the issues I call that these are China's destiny. It all began with that very fast fertility transition. Here's my office at Texas A&M. Thank you very much. <laughs>